Sure. Okay. So for newcomers, first of all, we're going through a series of lessons learned and we're taking turns uh, dealing with uh, Bible personalities and what they have learned. As an example, last week we covered Nebuchadnezzar and he had a very painful exercise or a lesson in pride. Today we're going to be dealing with John the Baptist and you can see an exclamation point there. A lessons learned by John the Baptist exclamation point and then lessons learned by us question mark. And so, uh, my assignment was Matthew chapter 11, and the two lessons that we deal with are doubt and surrender, but there are uh, 10 other lessons that will be, will make those two more impactful. So we'll go through those very quickly, talking once again about lessons that John learned, and a question of whether we've learned them, yes or no. So, in the beginning, John's birth. Malachi, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. That's repeated in the New Testament. The angel is talking about John the Baptist. The angel says, he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Please note the, the, the concept that something is concealed in the Old Testament, but revealed in the New. And comparing those two scriptures, you see a uh, father-child relationship, but then it tightens it up a little bit where it talks about, and it's highlighted there, disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. So the, the, the hint there is we as um, the, the dominant, gener the older generation, have a responsibility to pull the younger generation along. And so first lessons learned, they you, you've known me since forever, Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I met a man la last night, as a matter of fact, we're comparing notes. I said, yeah, I'm a grandfather of 13 grandchildren. He said, I don't have any. He said, but my bought my daughter is going through uh, fertility uh, processes. And the topic of IVF came up, in vitro fertilization. And the man's countenance changed. He said, I'd love to have a grandchild so badly, but all those kids. And so there's an exercise there. I want to get back on track, but I just had to share that. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. You eyes saw my unformed substance. We covered a book recently called Name Above All Names. And the last chapter talked about, um, it, it was kind of flowery as far as I was concerned, whether I'm part of the cosmos, whether I, whether I was evolved from some blob. And uh, the point of the matter is God knew me. He chose John the Baptist. He chose Jer Jeremiah before their birth. He not only chose us, we have a purpose. And again, from Luke 1, 17, the purpose is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Third bullet is, he gives us a voice, a voice crying in the wilderness. Some time ago, we studied Moses and Moses quarreling with God at the burning bush. He said, I, I can't talk. I'm not eloquent. And the Lord said to Moses, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Well, my praise is that I'm not mute, uh, mute, I'm not deaf, I can see. And the question is, do I use those faculties, those gifts for God's praise? God gives us a voice. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness. When you see that word witness in the New Testament, it comes from the Greek word where we get the word martyr. And so... John the Baptist was martyred as we think of martyrs in terms of his head chopped off. But Moses was also a martyr. Both of them gave their lives. 
John the Baptist gave his life and it ended very quickly. Moses gave his life, but it took 120 years of all of his life to be given. First, the fourth bullet, recognize Jesus is coming and behave accordingly. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I had to resurrect this movie this past week. That's um, Rachel Scott. She was one of the kids that was killed in Columbine. And I watched that movie this past weekend with my 15-year-old grandson. And as the movie started, he was all squirmy. And this is a girly thing. And I'm not interested. And I don't like it. I said, you don't have to look if you don't want to. But he sat through it. And we got to the very end, the uh, the martyr scene he got very quiet and very serious and he was very appreciative for those that aren't familiar the storyline is about this girl wrestling with her ability to to live for jesus and among peer pressure she was going after some guy as the the story goes on the guy didn't want anything to do with her and she was drifting more to the guy and less uh, towards jesus and at the very end of that uh chaste relationship the guy said, I didn't know you were a Christian. And that blew her away. At the very end, at the very end, the um, perpetrator asked her if she believes in God. And the words that they used in this movie is, you know that I do. And so that was the climax and how the thing was turned around. We're going to interweave Rachel Scott with John the Baptist as we go through this thing. Now, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And you take a look at that, and I have to confess, I have never eaten a locust. I'm not looking forward to eating a locust. I'm a beekeeper. I have my own honey. But uh, John the Baptist chose to live a life of austerity. And so the fifth lesson is godly contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Now, Job was one of the richest men that, that was around at that time. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. James tells us every good and perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights. But now John the Baptist takes that a step further. John the Baptist says, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given from him, given him from heaven. John the Baptist is saying, accept the bad along with the good. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Sixth bullet is humility in the face of popularity. We go back to that thing, and when we studied Luke's gospel, we went through his the, the process of his growing popularity he went from a whisper to an echo to a surge and, to, and there's one point where the bible says the people were trampling each other so john the baptist had people from all over judea coming to hear him preach humility in the face of popularity and even though there's humility there's always room for a lesser me he must increase but i must decrease christ in you the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. We're covering a lot of verses, but if there's one verse I want you to walk away with, it's right here, Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. The Romans were experts at crucifixion. No one came down alive. Some took a long, painful, excruciating death Jesus was on the cross six hours, but he died. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's always room for a lesser me. 
When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And so you see, do not be afraid in opposition. First Timothy says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control or sound mind or timidity, take your pick. But he did not give us a spirit of fear. We're not to be afraid in, op in, in terms of opposition. I want you to look at that in Mark 13 and think about Rachel Scott. When they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've heard that name before, Rachel Scott, but basically the, the perpetrator said to, her, said to her, do you believe in God? And her response was, you know that I do. And then the trigger was pulled. Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So we're going to take a little bit of a rabbit trail here, put all the Herods into perspective. Herod the Great was the one who killed the boy babies in Bethlehem, the one who built Herod's temple. Herod Antipas was the one who dealt with John the Baptist in the preceding slide and the one before whom Jesus appeared. John the Baptist had a problem because Philip was married to his niece Herodias and Antipas took, took her from him and ended up marrying his, his niece. So then you have Herod Agrippa. He was the one who killed the apostle James and Agrippa II was the one who dealt with Paul's trial. Uh, King James would say, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. So bullet nine, See sin as sin, and I know you've heard this phrase before, hate sin, but love the sinner. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, John the Baptist was out preaching and baptizing, and it was a daily, a daily thing. And so Jesus just happened by. And we have watch for Jesus in our daily lives. It's a God thing. So what is a God thing? So many times I'm reading my Bible, turn on Christian radio, and the guy happens to preach on the exact same uh, verse that I read. Or I'm humming a song and the radio pops up with the exact same song. Those are God things. And you don't get those God things unless you're doing your side. In other words, if I'm not reading my scripture, then it's impossible for the preacher to, to ping that same verse. We're to watch for Jesus in our daily lives, uh, not just Sundays. We go out of our way Sunday to put on the right clothes, go to the right building, do the right things, smile the way we smile. Watch for Jesus in our daily lives. Again, from the newcomers, we just covered this book, Name Above All Names. For every look at yourself, Take 10 looks at Christ. Let your soul be filled with a sense of the excellency of Christ. And I'll add, take 10 looks for Christ, because Christ is everywhere if we're looking for him. So now we're to the scripture that I was assigned to, John in prison. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent words by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? NIV uses the phrase, expect someone else. And we're going to have a play on words on that in a little bit. When, Jesus, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples. We're going to skip these verses because that's the punchline of what we're talking about here. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about him. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind. In other words, did you go out looking for a pushover? John the Baptist was a rugged guy. He lived out in the open. He dressed in camel's hair. He ate locusts and wild honey. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? In other words, you go out to see a rich man? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. 
This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So who was John the Baptist? First of all, he was a prophet. He was spirit filled. And we read that from the very beginning. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. From the lessons learned we covered, he was purposeful. He was outspoken. He was no stranger to adversity. He was humble. In a word, he was the best this world has to offer. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. And yet, doubt can seep into anyone's life. I mentioned at the start that these first 10 bullets help us understand bullet number 11. He had all those things going for him, and yet he doubted. Doubt can seep into anyone's life. I will also tell you, sin to the greatest extent can seep into anyone's life. Witness David, witness Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, yet he had a thousand women on the string. Doubt can seep into anyone's life. I'm going to come back to these verses. Now, when Christ heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, we're going to take John the Baptist off the table and put self on the table. I expect most, if not all of us, participate in weekly worship. What Most, if not all of us, deal with daily Bible readings, daily devotionals. So we're hearing about the deeds of Christ. And yet, we doubt sometimes. He sent word to his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? So now we're going to say, okay, the best that the world had to offer doubted. And now we're going to ask the question, why did John doubt? And the answer is, Christ did not meet his expectations. Should we look for another? Should we expect another? So, what were his expectations? This is the verse that will tell us what his expectations were. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What were his expectations? He was looking for the complete package. And I will tell you, my two fatal flaws are impatience and anger. And so this is up there almost as a jest. God, give me patience. I want it, and I want it now. But what was the complete package of Christ that he was looking for? What were his expectations that were not being met? When he was in prison, he wasn't there and uh, pitying himself over the poor conditions. He already lived in poor conditions. He was pitying himself over the amount of time he was spending in there. So what were his expectations? He was expecting the comings of Christ. He was expecting the defeat of the Romans, and when the Romans go down, so does Herod and his regime. He was expecting his release from prison. So what about us? Christ is coming for me. The government shall be upon his shoulders. How cool would it be if that happened before November 5th? And I will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And I will say that includes his timing. So many times I've, I've said, oh, the rapture would be so handy. But yet I'm still waiting for him to come. Jesus said, occupy till I come. A modern translation would say, invest till I come. Not sell whatever you have, go stand on the mountainside and wait on me. But live your life. Watch for Christ. Be a spokesperson, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So we are to not doubt, but keep the faith, and surrender to God's ways, his thoughts, and his timing. And all that comes together with Romans 8, 28. You know, if you're on the hot seat and somebody offers to you Romans 8, 28, you say, well, that's somewhat cliche-ish. So we have to think about Romans 8, 28 before we get on the hot seat. 
And sometimes I'd like to get off the hot seat faster than God's got, faster than he's got it in his plans. But all things will work together according to his purpose. So how are these things satisfied? Dealing with doubt and surrendering with God. And the answer is through his word. And I have this arrow here. Verse two, many of us could get in a rut. We go to church on Sunday because that's what we do. We go to church on Sunday because it's good for the kids. We go to church on for Sunday and you can fill in your own blank. But are we hearing what's being said? And what Jesus said was this. He said, I am working a work around you. And so believe in me. The king is coming. <clears throat> so thanks to Susie for many, many months ago, we're going to end with a song. It's a very familiar song, Trust and Obey. But I want us to look through it through the eyes and the ears of John the Baptist, through the eyes and the ears of Rachel Scott, and then with the question mark at the end, through the eyes and ears of ourselves. Here we go. That was a sound check. Did you hear some music? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Here we go. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. What we never can prove, the delights of His love, until all on the altar we lay. For the favor He shows, and the joy He bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey.